I got love for you, man. You know what, I'm what are we talking about? You know, I'm not here to start any trouble. I'm only going to say nice things about you from now on. I think you're handsome, and I think you're a wonderful host. I'm fat and I'm overweight. Just don't say anything silly. I was waiting for you to say that. I'm not laughing about it. You think this is funny? I take it serious. You know, I don't want y'all to take anything out of context that I'm saying. He's very funny. He likes to joke around a lot. As a personality and as an entertainer, yes. This is going to be really quick. I'm not taking any questions. Go ahead and get comfortable. I'm going to talk for a little bit. You're listening to Cabbie Presents, the podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the show. Appreciate you guys clicking and subscribing to the Cabbie Presents podcast. I'm your host, Cabbie Richard. Sorry for the delay in new episodes. Like, the last month has been insane with travel. I'm not making an excuse. I'm going to tell you why there's been... I don't know, a delay of like two or three weeks, maybe a month even, from like March to April uh, for a solid like a six weeks. I traveled for most of those, oh man, like 45, 50 days. Um, and I'll give you a quick recap, uh, as unintentionally annoying as possible, of what I've been up to. Did some March Madness stuff with JC, JP Aaron Sebia, Jeff Carter, Ryan Getzlaff, and most of the L.A. Kings uh, during its opening weekend. I was in Los Angeles and Tampa, and one night in L.A., uh, we watched Gonzaga lose to Wichita State, and uh, probably 20 members of the team were there at this sports bar, the Shore Club or something like that. It was pretty legit. Also working on a campaign with Kit Kat with Amir Johnson, P.K. Subban, and the aforementioned J.P. Aaron Sebia. There was a quick stop in Edmonton for another project, then off to Chicago to interview Andrew Wiggins, who is a high, Canadian high school basketball player, currently ranked number one, the number one recruit in the nation uh, by ESPN, the Associated Press. He won the Gatorade Player of the Year. Um, I interviewed him at the McDonald's All-American game. Then it was a trip back to Los Angeles to meet Harrison Ford for the Jackie Robinson biopic, 42, at a movie junket. I had a sit down with ASAP Rocky while he was in town here in Toronto for a concert that he shared the stage with uh, Rihanna. Then a quick trip uh, to New York to interview Carmelo Anthony. I went to Miami to interview Mark Wahlberg and The Rock for the Pain and Gain movie. And I had a chat with George St. Pierre for his new book, The Way of the Fight. That's been the last like four to six weeks. So again, my apologies for the delay. I've been meaning to get back into the studio to record some conversations. And finally, I return. Today, my very special guest will give you some of the backstory of uh, my career and his career. Uh, for those who've only discovered me via this podcast, we're going to shine some light on the bizarre, on a bizarre career and uh, landing at TSN and some other places. My guest joins me in the studio right now. If it's going to be uh, an interview, I'm going to conduct it. So I'll answer my own questions, ask myself the questions, then give y'all the answers. It was the turn of the century when as a, a part-time actor, a part-time script writer, and a part-time man on the street, my life changed when a young student from the University of Western Ontario walked into the SCORE television network. His brain was filled with the most creative ideas in television. The first of many was cabby on the street hockey. When a young Dave Crix, AKA my man D said to me, I have some ideas for you. That was in February of 2002 when he said that line to me for, and for the better part of the decade, he's been my main collaborator and producer and the Michael Jordan to my Scotty Pippen. Welcome to the podcast. Dave Crix, my man D. How are you? Good, good. I mean, it sounds so amazing like that. Started <laughs> from the bottom, now we're here. <laughs> That's right. Hey, so uh, what movie did you see tonight? Uh, Beyond the Pines with uh, Bradley Cooper. How was and, it? Uh, and Ryan Gosling. It was actually amazing. I loved it. Oh, really? Best movie I've seen this year. Wow. Okay. Beyond, yeah. And then who, that's, uh, who directed that one? It, the it's the like same a, guy that did Blue Valentine. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't remember that dude's name. I should... I should probably look it up, but I'm uh, gonna you'd try like to... it. A lot of symbolism. Oh, okay. So I gotta. Okay, so you gotta go in with like uh, looking at two different. So there's the narrative, but then you gotta look at you know what these these things mean. What do these scenes and these yeah, images mean? It, it's a it's a generational movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what does that mean? It means like um, 
the way I saw, I'm still tripped because I just got out of the movie. I got the text from Cab, like, come on down, let's talk, just so people understand. And, you know, so I'm watching this movie and I, and I just got out, so I'm still trying to, like, wrap it around my head and trying to figure out. But what what I think it means is it's a story about fathers and sons uh, through generations. Ah, uh, okay. And, and different upbringings, but really it's a father and son generation theme. Okay. All right, that's cool. Yeah, I think I would dig that. And watch out Ebert. Oh, no, I guess he's passed away, so he doesn't have to watch out anymore. That's true. Uh, on on Twitter, it's at my man DK. Instagram, it's at my man DK. On Vine, is it the same? At my man DK. At my man DK. All one word, M-Y-M-A-N-D-K. You want to hear a crazy story about that, actually? Please. I went to bed on Friday night Yeah. with 401 Instagram followers. Okay. I woke up on Saturday morning with a 20K. What? Yeah. It's crazy, and it makes no sense. So the only thing I can figure out that-, that What? So wait, your Instagram numbers went up by- 17,000 people here or there. That's unbelievable. Not 17,000. You said you had 400 followers, and now it's at 20- Oh, sorry. You know, it, 19, a, I was saying 17,000 more than my um, my Twitter followers. Oh, okay. So yeah. you have 3,000 Twitter followers, and now you have 20,000 Instagram followers. Which has also gone up steadily since my in, my Instagram has gone up. So, uh, What photo is it? What photo do you so have on there? The that... only thing I can think of is that somebody really famous must have shouted me out. And because, you know, 20,000 people added me, I can't go back far enough to find out who it was. Oh, on the but does it say? Oh, it does say who's, fo- who's following you, right? Wow, that's that's insane. That's a huge, it's that's insane. a massive so number. If I like tag someone, someone really, really famous, someone has to, really, really famous must stuff. There's no other explanation for it. I went from 450 to 20k. <laughs> that's amazing. I went from so, 3,000 uh, Twitter followers. I'm almost at 9,000 now. So what what image do you think it was? Like, is there an image that has like several thousand likes? No. No, th- that's the thing. I'm like, I've got a lot of, you know my Instagram, a lot of stupid pictures on there. Like um, my staff, I put them in like Street Fighter uh, poses? poses and stuff yeah. like that. Um, a lot of uh, stuff we do at work, a Stanley Cup uh, ring. There's one of us with GSP here. Um, but, my, you know, I, I take pictures of my vinyl records a lot. Um, but, but nothing with like 2000 likes or something. So maybe it's just an anomaly or a mistake, but nah, it's that's that's somebody like co-signing you or saying, "Oh, this picture's funny or this picture's cool or whatever they say." But someone with a lot of social influence. 100%. So thanks Kim Kardashian or the Jenners. <laughs> I appreciate it. So, okay, so for the people who don't know, I'm uh, I'm here in studio with uh, Dave Cricks, who's my producer. What what is your what is your job at TSN? Like, how would you describe it to people who don't really know what a producer is? Uh, yeah, uh, it's it's a babysitter for yourself and Michael Landsberg. <laughs> I really produce is. Off the Record, uh, so a daily show that's on um, TSN, which is a kind of a talk show format, uh, debate, and we have guests like Gary Payton and Mitch Williams, and we have local reporters, and we talk. Yeah, but you have, like, big guests. You, those, are, those are, like, your normal, like, your your weekly guys. We do. We We have some big guests, yeah. Uh, we we tried to get as big guests as we can, as we can get. We had a lot of hip hop stars recently, which fits very well with Michael. <laughs> so we've had uh, for those for those who don't know, Michael Landsberg is like a middle aged. Um, he's like he's like a like a like a high school teacher. It's like it's like your friend's dad, like a very nice man, but like hip hop, it, it's not really his generation's no, music. No. He's more like from the from, you know, Huey Lewis in the news. He'd be in the news. <laughs> I was gonna say the Beach Boys, but right. Beach Boys might be too old for for uh, Michael Landsberg. It's a little bit too old. Is, like, my, he, is middle age? Is that like what is middle? Is that too? I don't want to insult him. Is that like is middle age? What is like your mid forties or fi- are you fifty? Is middle age I fifty? Fifty. I just say fifty. We're all gonna plan to live to one hundred. We all want to, I guess, maybe live to one hundred. I don't know if I do, but middle would be fifty. Okay, so yeah, well, he's around. I don't know if he's quite fifty yet, but he's around that, right? He's around that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you babysit, uh, myself and Michael Landsberg, but you also, what the, there are other things that you actually do. Like you do more often than babysit us. Well, actually I don't know. Cause I, cause I, I'm, I'm a lot to friggin' uh, deal with. Yeah, we, we come up with ideas for shows and we try to put on the best television that we would watch and hopefully other people like it. So producing is, is such a subjective term. It's organizing 
creating, um, putting things together. So, um, okay, so one of the things that you do uh, for our stuff on uh, Cabby Presents is you, you like organize shoots, but then like you have, you have to get, we have to get time with these athletes. So um, this year, at the beginning of the year, we aired an interview with Mike Tyson and we were at Mike Tyson's house. How did you set that up? Mike Tyson is a really interesting one because I think in the terms of cabbie presents or, or cabbie on the street or all the different cabbies, I think there's like five cabbies. <laughs> yeah. He is at the top. Like he's one of those kind of huge legends that we have been lucky enough to talk to and um, realized recently that we could actually get in touch with him through one of my chase producers, Aaron Bronstetter, who is probably, I used to think I was good at a chase producer, but this guy is a different level. He loves Chase Purdue, <laughs> and he gets a lot of enjoyment out of making connections with stars. So we're always dropping names and, and, and people that are in the news and whatever, and he somehow touched base with Mike Tyson's wife. Her name is Kiki. Yes, a very nice lady. And uh, he arranged for us to go down there and talk to him about a, um, a phone message thing. That he, all these, these guys are involved in different things. Mike Tyson at that time was doing phone messages for people. Right. So he said, we can come to his house in Las Vegas and talked to him about phone messages. It was called, uh, I think it was called Star Greets. I'm not sure if he's still doing it, but when we went there last year, it was, uh, it was I, I mentioned Star Greets, and it's in, it's in the, the, the piece, um, but that was, that was the thing. And like the reason it took so long for us to, to air it is because we wanted, to, I mean, I spoke, to, if you're going to talk to Mike Tyson, you're going to talk about the friggin' Tigers and the movie The Hangover, which was a big part of his resurgence in his second career as this lovable guy. I mean, Jimmy Kimmel's been awesome in in uh, using Mike in various ske ske sketches. And um, so we had to get clearance of that. And I had to get clearance for the music for the song Paris, which Mike Tyson is, which Jay-Z says his name along with Michael Jackson's and Michael Jordan's. And that cost money. That yeah, And our go. budget was uh, over... Capacity. I don't right. know what you're saying. Overdraft. Yeah. Yeah, like we, at the yeah. bank. <laughs> yeah, we were definitely in the red for a while and getting in trouble every single week. Like you guys you guys gotta be more responsible. I'm like, no, I know, we're we're working on it. But yeah, we got um so we got in trouble. So so I'm in studio with uh Dave Cricks, my uh, longtime producer and collaborator. Okay, let's so I wanted to start with Mike Tyson, because Mike Tyson one of the biggest interviews that we've ever done. And like that's and we we've done this uh here at T S N. Um but that's not where we started. Uh, and, and I don't want to go like all the way back. To, I'm sure that'll come up in conversation, but there are a couple of like moments where things started to change for us. And I want to start with the NBA jam. No, what was it called? NBA jam. What was it called? Three on three, the NBA three on three. Oh yeah. So, hoop it up three on hoop, three. Hoop it yeah. ups. Okay. So that's where, that's like the first time that we traveled on a consistent basis. So for people in the U S hoop it up is this like three on three street ball tournament, which takes place in Canada in like six or eight cities and in 05 we started to travel uh at the score and we were covering these tournaments we're just finding yeah. random people playing basketball and making stories out. and i think it goes back even further than that because i th i remember that there was a time when we only taped in toronto right and and it's not that i don't love toronto we are we definitely represent and love toronto but we did every street in toronto we did Queen Street, Danforth, <laughs> Richmond Street, King Street, lots of times. Yes. So every landmark in Toronto, including the CN Tower, which security guards kicked us out at one time. Right. We did over and over again. So we, we realized at a certain point, we need to travel. So we drove somewhere a couple times. We drove to Boston. We drove to Boston, Boston Montreal. Montreal yeah. You know, and we didn't have much of a budget at the score. So we needed someone who would send us to places. Right. And uh, along comes the NBA, and they say, well, we'll send you to different places in Canada for this Hoop It Up 3-on-3 tournament. Now, I don't know if this, I don't know if all these years are going to blend for you, because we, we, did, we did three consecutive years. We're 2005, 2006, 2007, and all these, all these uh, cities. So it was, uh, it was Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Vancouver, Toronto. And was there a Halifax? Why were we in Halifax at one time? No, we but were... we went to Windsor. No, London. London, yeah. But um, why were we in Halifax at one time? Did we just go to cover that game? We did. We did. We did the hockey game. The hockey game. And we did Saint FX. No, we did. It was a Saint Mary's football game. Saint Mary's football game. Yeah. And See, when we're reminiscing here, what's going to happen is we're going to flip back and forth in times and shoots and different dates, like Quantum Leap. 
or just because there's so much recollection. Okay, so do you remember? Okay, so uh, 05. I'm not sure if you're going to remember, but okay, so there was like. It was, it was, are we done with the Mike Tyson story, by the way, or are we going to come back to that? We could come back to it. Okay, we, good, because it's a good story. Okay, we can yeah. come back to it. Oh, yeah, because then, yes, you know, we should, uh, yeah. You got to write that down and remember it. Yeah, because if I don't, then I'm going to forget. Um, it's good. It's kind of a teaser. So later in this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so we're, we're traveling around. Okay, and so we went to, uh, Calgary was the first stop. Yeah. And we, we, ran, we went to visit Mastermind. Right, and, went to a visit and, mastermind. That's the first thing we did. Got off the plane, had lunch with mastermind. Yeah, and we went to an Earl's, and that was the first time we saw Earl's. We didn't know what Earl's mastermind, was. Mastermind, legendary uh, mixtape hip hop producer. Yeah, he was a DJ that had like owned Toronto and uh, for like I, for the better part of a decade. I remember driving to Toronto in high school to buy Mastermind's mixtapes, and every month he had a mixtape with a different color cover. It was purple it was light blue it was orange it was yellow he started doing the hip-hop tapes once a month and then he did the r&b tapes and his blends were so amazing like mastermind was the baddest dj and now he's a dj at that time in calgary so well, he was uh not a, well, he was like a, a, a radio on, dj radio, yeah. radio personality yeah radio personality so we go to calgary and we meet uh, mastermind and, and uh and then he tells us about a car show He's like, you guys should go to this car show, which was at the Oval. Because we didn't know what we were going to do. We knew we were going to do the basketball, but since we're traveling, we have to tape a lot of segments, get the most of the bang for our buck. That's right. So we go, we did the, the basketball thing, which is nothing really I can really remember. from. I think it rained. We went to the car show, and that's where we met. Uh, Bo. Bo Yakimission and Nick. I can't remember his name. but we So we did this bit at this car show. We meet these two guys who we'll refer to later. Uh, no, it was on that same trip that we went out with them because it was my birthday. No, that was in Edmonton. Sorry, Calgary. Okay, so I'm, I'm all <laughs> over the place. Uh, and then uh, we um, uh, then we did a we did a bit with uh, Darnell Kennedy, who at the time was a quarterback for the Calgary Stampeders. Great, great guy. And he joined us for as we were walking on 17th Ave at Melrose, interviewing random, mostly girls, but people on the street. And uh, and I was wearing this awful shirt. I remember this floor. It was terrible. Like it. And I don't want to get into too much of the tangent about my awful choice in wardrobe. But shout but out to Darnell because this is the first time an athlete actually went out of their way to do something with us. Yeah. That wasn't, you know, at their team practice or anything. The guy joined us on the street. He, maybe he was a backup quarterback <laughs> for the Calgary <laughs> St. Peters. He may not have been the backup, but he might have been the third string guy. But he was awesome. He was awesome. Um, so, okay. So I'm trying to remember. Uh, there was, do you remember the lady in Vancouver that offered to cook me food? Oh, yeah. Big ladies at these Hoop It Up tournaments seem to like cabbie. A lot. This like, one was particularly that, big. Yeah, that was that's my wheelhouse. Like, women who have my body type. So there, there oh, was... Oh, she was way bigger than you, Well, dude. I don't know. She was... She was so she like she, her kid was playing in the in the tournament. <laughs> she offered to cook us to like go over to her house and her, she would cook us a meal. And I was like, and I and I tried to be nice about she it. She was, was aggressive. Like, yeah, that was um that was uh, fun. So the, so we then we go to Edmonton, right? And uh, I don't even know how I got George Lorac's number. Do you remember? No. No, see, these are the things I, I don't remember. I don't even know if you you had his number or like. But we we oh, you I, know we, Kwame may have given it to you. Oh right, it was Kwame. Yes. Another DJ radio personality in Edmonton who was from Toronto but moved to Edmonton. Master Ron's also from Toronto, moved to Calgary. So we hooked up with George LaRock, and we and we didn't know any better, but we did like a tour of West Edmonton Mall. And we didn't is, call them all ahead of time and say we're going to come bring a camera into the mall. We just showed up. <laughs> yeah. We just like like renegades and. So we're doing this uh, tour of the mall, and we're playing road hockey in there. He's teaching me how to fight, teaching me how to skate. We try on some clothes at like the country country store, which he took a a beating from his teammates once that segment aired. But George LaRock, for people who don't know, was like one of the toughest enforcers, maybe the toughest enforcer ever in the history of hockey. This dude was a tank, and he like, and he was a southpaw. So there, it was rare. If ever that he lost a fight, I I don't know. I've never I've never seen it. But anyway, he's a big dude, and he took some ribbing from his teammates because we dressed him up in like the silliest, tightest, tightest. Like, like this was before skinny jeans, and his jeans were really really skinny, and he had a cowboy hat and a and an ugly t-shirt. It was great. 
He read us children's books in the in the bookstore. Right, right. It was. Um, you guys went into a photo booth and took <laughs> pictures together, <laughs> dude. And we were even on the like, we did we took we rode the rides. Yeah, at the, uh, you did uh, that hammer thing with him. Yeah, and I got smashed. The, the the strength hammer. Yeah, and he just destroyed it. I got smashed. So they're they're like so on this tour. So okay, now let's go to okay, let's go to the next year because I think we meet Peter Gurgis the next year. We're we're out there with Joey Graham in Vancouver, and so here's so we're walking. Says Dave. Uh, myself and the reason we're there with Joey Graham just because these these NBA tournaments is three on threes associated themselves with the Raptor so they would bring a Raptor to every um, event right so we were so we went to uh, uh, and one day we're just walking around so it's Joey Graham his brother Brian you and I and I don't even know if our camera guy was with us but so we're walking down Granville Street and um, this dude is just on the street and he's like hey we're where are you guys headed? And we're like, I don't know. We're just going to try to find some place. And he's like, come in, come inside for a drink. So we go into this place called Santa Fe. And this was one of the moments that changed our life. Changed, changed my life for sure. We go into Santa Fe and it's like this oasis of women. It's a, it's a restaurant lounge. And I had never really been to Vancouver before. I guess we went the year before. Oh, there was that story with the Seven Eleven. You gave me twenty bucks. Yeah, we're gonna. Yeah, I was wondering if you're gonna bring that up. I don't I know. Pretty, what the, it's like your podcast. How much do you do you you know? How much can I, yeah. that kind of stuff give me? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pause Peter Gurgis. So the quick story about <laughs> quantum the, leap. This yeah, is keep going back and forth between years and stories. Same location, Vancouver, two a.m. Or we start. Do we have to start earlier when we did the shoot? In Stanley Park, and we met the girl well, on her date. On a date, so you know, girls. <laughs> so they, so yeah, <laughs> met a girl on a date. Then we go out, and then we just r- run into this girl later out at the. Well, she was in the segment. Yeah, what the place? I think it's called the Caprice now. I can't remember what it was called back then, but we see her, and she's with a friend, and everybody's having a good time, and and fast forward to it's like. <laughs> I uh, I don't know if I can tell this part. Anyway, DK comes through with a great assist. I have no money, and I was like, hey, man, can I borrow 20 bucks? I need to go to the 7-Eleven to buy some gum. And uh, so he's like, yeah, man. So he gives me 20 bucks. I I go say hello to this fr- new friend, and then, uh, I'm, then it's like 28 days later when I leave. It's like those streets are white hot. And there's nobody in the streets, and it's... Is this the night that you called, and I was just so drunk, and the phone rings. I think it, it might have even been my hotel phone. Yeah, I call, like, yeah. You know, like, can you pick me up? And we were staying in Coquitlam, which is like 45 minutes outside of Vancouver. My cab, first of all, I don't know how to get there. There's no <laughs> GPS in our car. And, <laughs> and I've just had so many rum and Cokes. Right. I, I can't do it. And, uh, we yeah, so... I'm desperate because I have no money. I had like maybe 12 bucks. I'm like, I can't take a taxi back to Coquitlam Coquitlam because it's 45 minutes away. And so I'm like, DK, can you come get me? And you're like, cab, if I got into a car, I would die. I'm like, all right. So I'm, uh, but then you're like, just take a cab to the hotel and I'll pay for it when you get there. I wake this guy up at like, you know, 6, 11 a.m. And he comes out, pays for the cab and then we, pass out but thank you for that assist yeah, one I of thought about that one one of many assists so vancouver the next year we're at santa fe we go upstairs in this they had so peter's place had these like beds and you know people and then they brought food to these beds and they were just filled with women I'm like what is this freaking place it yeah was, just a, it didn't make sense it wasn't real and that's when we realized that peter gurgis was different from all other men. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few. We're going to talk about a few life changers uh, in this uh, podcast. I'm in studio with Dave Cricks, my producer. There's Peter Gurgis. We got to talk about uh, Doug Donald, who introduced us to Dave Wilder. Um, and we got to talk about how Kevin Weeks introduced us to Jared Stoll. Yeah. Um, those are those are three big ones. Um, that time in, uh, I don't even know where to go next because I'm thinking of Halifax, where there's a hill. At St. Mary's, which is a university in Halifax, where when touchdowns are scored, uh, people slide down this hill. It's awesome. We did it, and I remember crushing you. Yeah, I'm surprised I didn't over. break your ribs because I like rolled on top of you, yeah. and I'm a solid 140 pounds, yeah. heavier than you. Are. I'm two people heavier than you. Are. I do remember being like, uh, 
in like real pain right when you rolled over me and then getting to the bottom of the hill and then looking at all my limbs just to make sure I wasn't Kevin Ware. <laughs> <laughs> Man, they're all on me still, so it was good. We walked it off, you know? And then the, on that same trip, we, we met Sidney Crosby's ex-girlfriend. Oh, yeah. Which was weird because I, I, we didn't know Sidney Crosby and then like, Anybody could say they're Sidney Crosby's ex-girlfriend or girlfriend. Right, but you also we also met first of many strange super fans, a guy who wouldn't leave you alone that night. And my whole job was to run interference yeah. and set picks in front of him. And I, that's one of many assists. So I'm so I'm talking to this girl, and we're dancing and tr- trying to have a conversation, and this dude just wanted to talk about, I don't know what, but like, was spitting hot breath onto my neck in my face, and that's like the worst. Like when 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 you're when people are out and everybody's generally friendly, but then you have those guys who are a little overzealous, but they don't realize that they're spitting on you. Cabby, Cabby, I love the Darnell Kennedy segment. <laughs> yeah, the I Darnell Kennedy segment was amazing. I, I'm not sure if anybody. Yeah, no, it wasn't that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was that one. Yeah. Back to Edmonton, Bo Yakka Mission. Right. Okay. So let's go there. So the first time. And I guess we can go on this thread. The first time we covered the Stanley Cup Finals, so for for like at the score, you know, I was given total creative freedom. We could do whatever we wanted, but within like we couldn't just go anywhere. We had a budget where we had to, you know, I had to I had to pitch trips to my boss. Right, and we would always try to like you know raise the ante a little bit. You know, first can we go to um, across Canada? Great, found a way to do that. Can we go to games now? Right. Okay. Can we go to the Stanley Cup? So we so Edmonton made this run and we didn't know Stoll and Torres that we met them in the summertime after when we went to right. Kevin Weeks' uh, yeah. tournament. So we um were covering and our media credentials were just practices. So that's all we could go to. We couldn't go to games, we couldn't go to post game, couldn't go to the locker room, we could just go to the practices. So we're in Edmonton at the same time as the Hoop It Up. Yeah. Which was like Jan- it was June. Um, and uh, we know we're doing some bits with the Oilers and uh, and they're playing the Carolina Hurricanes. And this is the first time I meet Eric Stoll. And actually, Eric Stoll, excuse me, Jared Stoll, Eric Stoll. And um, I think actually Coolius gave me this idea about, he told me that there were like four brothers, four Stoll brothers. Uh and he's like, Kevin, yeah, you could be the fifth stall. I'm like, no, oh, that's that's kind of funny. So the first time I meet Eric Stall, I, 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 I say, hey, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure why you guys didn't claim me. I'm the fifth stall brother, much like Eddie Murphy, 20 years earlier did the skit about the being the fifth Beatle, and the Beatles at the time he called they were the Clarences, and he was the fifth Beatle, and he mm-hmm. played the recordings of backwards on. Right. So I, anyway, I stole Eddie Murphy's bit. Anyway, so on that trip. We are in uh, Edmonton, and we meet these guys in Calgary the year before, Bo and Nick. And we go out. So we end up, So here's the thing: we meet. So we'll meet some interesting people, and we meet these girls that were friends with some of the hockey players. Well, one was a friend, and the other one we knew. He's and, doing the quotation things with friends. Okay. So yeah. So. So these girls were so it's like game I don't know three or four of the Stanley Cup final and these one of the girls was really friendly with Alex Hemsky and um they're like they didn't even want to go to the games like they had tickets for these games they didn't want to go to the games um and we went out with these girls and our friends from Calgary came to Edmonton and I remember being so I was I was so uh enthusiastic in my partying let's say okay i was drinking a lot and um <laughs> i don't and i was it was so sick that night that i think like after about an hour of being sick i think you like you knocked under like cab you gotta go like we gotta we gotta put you in a taxi and you go sleep it off and i was like all right all right and i'm not even sure how i made home but another one of your assists uh came through and that was so on that trip we met jared Stoll. And uh, or that experience. No, we met Jared. So Rafi came to the. Um, if I could be wrong, but Rafi came that summer to the weeks thing. Stoll did not, but Rafi did. And then we wanted to go visit Rafi at training camp the next year, and he introduced us to Stoll, who was there that night, and came the next year with Rachel to the to the Kevin Weeks thing. 
Oh, is that what it was? That's how it went. Because the first time we went, it was it was Mike Johnson there. So 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 Kevin yeah. Weeks used to do these golf tournaments in Barbados, and he would invite NHL players to to come. So in '05. Uh, Vince LeCavalier and Brad Richards, who were both members of the Tampa Bay Lightning, they came, and this is after they won the Stanley Cup final. Right, and they came, and Rafi was there, and Anthony Stewart was there. Right, that's right. And then the following year, Jared Stoll and Rafi Torres came, and they were in the Stanley Cup final. And then the following year, it was Jason Spezza and Ray Emery. They right. came, and they were in the Stanley Cup final. Right. Um, so yeah, okay. So there was that one night in Edmonton where we went for, I don't even remember what that bit was. It was oh five. It was like September of oh five, and we went out with the guys and the the dudes at the time, they ran the city and it was the first night. That I, was that the first night we, no, oh, that was the first night we really partied with athletes. I think. Partied with? I mean, we did in. See, we crossed the line in Barbados. The, I think it was the second time we did. First time we did as well. We were on the bus with Lauren Woods. Oh yes, and Milt Palacio. And Milt Palacio. Who are like and we just Raptors. go to the bars with them and, and and drink with them. So it was kind of the beginning. I mean, it wasn't the same as the next year. It was even better. Yeah. But uh, you know, and so then because we crossed the line with Raffi, he's like, "Come to the bar with us." Right. So we did one night, and I was dating a girl at the time that lived in Edmonton, so I couldn't really go out for too long. So I had to like leave, and you guys were having so much fun. And, like, the Oilers, like, guys were making, they were the bartenders. It was, like, early, early training camp. The bar staff looked so put out. Like, they didn't know what to do. The Oilers were in control of their bar. They had no control. It was the Iron Horse. Shout out to the Iron Horse, which I think for a time was an institution in Edmonton, Alberta. They were pouring whatever they wanted. Yeah. Just took over. Yeah, and I don't don't know if there was a tab that was paid that night. I think it was just, we were upstairs, and there were dudes just, like, in little areas of this bar, and then guys are just running amok. Right. See, guys, see, see these are the interesting lines we, we got to um, come close to without crossing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the next summer, so the Oilers lose in seven games, um, and we go to Barbados for uh, Kevin Weeks' golf tournament. And, the, and this is really the first time we cross the line from media guys to just guys. And this is a, an important moment for us in our careers because, like, in this business, it's all about trust. Trust and relationships. So when you form relationships, the athletes have to trust you in order for you to do the kind of material that we that we put out, like, to, that we pump out. Like. But also to get the, to, for them to accept the strange requests that they throw at them. Uh, so if they trust they know what it's going to look like, then it doesn't sound so weird to say to a guy, you know, I, I need you... Um, to come with me and we're going to, I'm just trying to think of something offhand that we did with guys like, like, I, well, the, like we went to Ryan Getzlaff's house once. Yeah. I need you to grab some hockey sticks and we're going to go play hockey on the beach. Right. Yes, exactly. We're going to go play hockey on the beach in Newport. Is that, is that cool with you? And, uh, so yeah, so, so we form these relationships and on that, that weekend when we're in Barbados, everybody like. It was a work trip, but it wasn't really work. It was a little bit of vacation. I mean, we shot a bunch of segments, and we shot like three or four segments, and um, and just the stories. Like I remember talking about, uh, oh, maybe it was the following year, but one time I think we were talking about Sidney Crosby once, weren't we? And it's like interesting to get when you're talking to athletes about other athletes in their sports, which we rarely do because that's kind of what most people would. Was want. Trish on that trip? Was Trish Stratus year. was the next year. That was Donovan Bailey, Trish Stratus. Trish is in studio tomorrow. Oh, nice. Um, 07 was, yeah, that was Spezza, Ray Emery. Um, there was another guy from uh, the Ottawa team. I can't remember his name. Um, but he was he was uh, a French dude. Really, really nice guy. He, he, brought, his, he brought his lady. Oh, yeah. Um, so... Um, uh, so yeah, so that that trip was, and that began your relationship with Jared Stoll, which I guess we'll get to because when we were in uh, L.A. like last month, uh, my friend Justin, uh, who's who's a, a very close friend of Jeff Carter's, at one point when we were um, out watching uh, basketball, we were watching Wichita Wichita State beat Gonzaga. Um, Justin asked me, he's like, "How was DK so close 
to Jared Stoll? Like, how did that relationship form? And I know we met in Barbados, and then um, the following year we went to cover Jared Stoll's golf tournament in Saskatoon, and then we went again. To, so we went in 2007, and then we went in 2008, and that's where uh, the relationship, I guess, was a little tighter. But you were always closer to Jared yeah, Stoll. Yeah, we had than good I conversations, great conversations. I find Jared a real interesting guy. Some people call him the coolest dude in hockey. I agree. He, I think so. I he's so. down to earth in a, in this way that you can. I find I can have conversations with him about a lot of stuff and. I think yeah, we bonded a little bit in in Barbados, but then we had the golf tournament. It's a good good conversation, with, and we had after that New Year's, and we had so much fun on New Year's, and I think like that's just stayed with us. That was we so Dave saw we spent we welcomed ushered in uh, two thousand and nine, mm. two thousand eight or two thousand nine. I think it's nine. And I mean, unfortunately, we can't date this because um, we saw the reunion that night of Travis Barker and A Track. No, DJ AM. DJ AM. At the Will Turn in LA. We, Jared like hooked up this part. We were there. Um, we did some. I remember the, the Columbus Blue Jackets were there because we saw. We were at the Mondrian or the, right. or the Standard Hotel and Rick Nash and Commodore were there and, and in, the, in the lobby. And those guys were going to party there. And we had dinner with uh, with Scott Hartnell, who's very close to Jared Stoll, at, on the on the, on the patio. And then we went to the party, right? Where uh, I actually spoke about this with Jared on the on, on the, the uh, on a podcast. Yeah. Yo, well, those guys had just been in a plane crash. Oh, well, Travis Barker and JJM. Yes, months before that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is their first time performing together, and obviously, you know, DJM has passed away since then. But that's how we'd know what day, what year it would be. I think I want to say it's. It's, I feel like it's going into, you might be right, going into 2009, but I'm not certain. I can't remember. So all this, we're, we're, so we're, we're still at the score. So then, so then there's, uh, okay, so, so Stoll, that's really, that's really how, how, it, how it started or how it developed? Yeah, I, I mean, at that point, that night, we just had so much fun, particularly after we left and we went to the Hollywood Hills, to our first Hollywood Hills party. And um, Rachel's, was driving it was just Jared's ex and um, she wasn't very happy with us because we took some bottles from that <laughs> <laughs> from the uh, from party the venue. We at. yeah we took three so there was like three bottles of of Grey Goose left and and then we're like well we don't want to just leave them here like they're all paid for let's take them to the next party so we shoved them down our pants like we were 10th graders and then we jumped into her SUV and she wasn't drinking she was the DD so you know, thank thankfully, um, she sacrificed that night for us. And her sister knew the guy who was throwing this party, which had a guest list yeah. and security and everything. But when she turned around in the car and saw that we stole the bottles, she just lost it on us. Like we were just little children, yeah, just behaving yeah. badly, she, <laughs> just just upset. And then we drove to this party, and you know, different than anything I've ever seen. There wasn't a bouncer at the door. There was a lady with the clipboard. But no, there was a guy. There was one guy in a suit. There was a big guy. Yeah, just making sure. But like it was lady on the clipboard and. Yeah. Guest list. Guest list to get into this house party. And Rachel's sister got us in, and you walk in, and it's surreal. It's like out of a movie. You know, in different rooms, in different places, people are doing different things, and, and it just seems to go on forever. It's endless, this house. And you walk out the back, and there's a pool, one of those never-ending pools. Yeah, didn't you step in it? I did. <laughs> <laughs> so now now one of my feet is, is just wet, just Soaked. soaking wet. Yeah. I, I don't give a fuck. I just, you know, I keep walking through this party. <laughs> And Jared and I just start opening doors in this house. You know, you'd open one door and there's just someone doing cocaine. We're like, okay, good. Close that door. Open up the next door and there's just a going on. We're just like, oh, good was it really? Yeah. Was, I know. I know you guys saw people having, but I know it was a. Oh, it's it's unbelievable. Just, we were just giggling, closing doors and opening up, the, you know, other doors and just a guy just tripping out in another room. Um, it was just fun exploring with Jared. And then I ended up leaving my cell phone in Rachel's car when she drove us home. Jared went to practice the next day and then drove across the city to drop it off at our hotel. So, good for him. Yeah, that was that dude is just a solid salt of the earth dude. I'm I'm trying to think of who was like the first was was Jared the first athlete that you had uh, like a friendship with, like that you guys would text each other or, or talk on the phone. No, I'm sure there was other guys. It's just I never followed through with. Them. I mean, Rafi for sure. Um, a lot of those guys from Barbados. I I can't remember. I'm trying to think of like who Anthony the f- Stewart. I went out with a few times. He's a, 
went out with them to a place just around here, actually. We we're near Queen and uh, Richmond. I can't I can't remember who the first, like, who the first athlete's phone, you know, I, but we did used to trade numbers because I would get, we would always get numbers of guys. Guys are always willing to offer you their numbers. We were just in um, Houston. We were in Houston? Where was the, uh, we were for, in Chicago. For the, uh, for the McDonald's, the McDonald's game. game. And there, yeah. there's Jalen Rose. He's like, Cab, take my number. Oh, so, that's cool. so it does happen. Jalen's a solid dude. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I can't remember how, so we were, I don't remember how, like the first time we went to someone's house, I think it was Getzlaff's house. Yeah. And that was in Kelowna. I, I feel like that was, we, we did Kelowna twice, right? No, I don't think we or did once? Kelowna once. Oh. So we went there for something called the center of gravity. And again, when we were at score, we'd like to shoot a bunch of other pieces while we were in some location. So we shot a, a piece at uh, Getzlav's house. Yeah. And he's got this campus in uh, Kelowna, and we, he picks us up on this boat. And we met these girls literally minutes before he showed up on the oh, boat. Yeah, like, what right. are you girls doing? I'm like, oh, we're just going out on the beach. Like, you guys want to come hang out with uh, a friend of ours? The, and the girl's like, okay. Yeah, we didn't tell him who. We just drove. Yeah, so we, so we, we show, <laughs> gets out. So I tell him, like, yo, RG, is it cool if these girls come hang out? He's like, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, so they came to hang out. That was uh, that was a good time. He had a, like one of those things, those chippers, like uh, he not had a, putting, a mini golf a putting green. He had a putting green, but you could also uh, chip from somewhere else. Yes, he had a, he had a, a green green to a green, so you yeah. could work on a chip I shot. Just, I, want, I want to go back to something because I I know that people listening probably think um, oh, it's cool. You got athletes phone numbers on your phone. Oh, that's awesome. Or maybe they don't. But I'll tell you why it isn't awesome. Because if you lose your phone, then people start calling those numbers. And sometimes those people don't know who the athletes are. And they could be French tourists in, say, oh, Spain. Oh, my gosh. That's right. <laughs> and the next thing you know, they're dialing David Ortiz's number. That's right. That's right. So we went to Spain in uh, 2008. Uh, uh, DK, myself, my boy Juice, and my dude Ari, We call who we call the truth. And we're in Barcelona, and we're, it's an awesome trip. We're, like, Taking, we're being tourists and we're taking in, we're at this like, uh, we're, we're looking at the Olympic site. Yeah. The, the summer so Olympic great site. Great hike, good walk. I leave my phone by one of those binoculars that you can put 25 cents in to see, like to look at some area of the city. I leave my phone and as I'm writing graffiti on this wall, like a total friggin' jerk, I'm writing, you know, fellas X was here, some kind of BS like that. And then I realize that I left my, I lost my phone. So we go sprinting back up this huge staircase up to this area where the, um, the binoculars, where the binoculars there, yeah. were. My phone's not there. I am freaking out because I've lost phones before. And there's this restaurant. So we go, happen to go to the restaurant. And I'm looking around panicked. And there's this family. And I'm not even sure how we got to find out that they had the phone. But Well, I'll tell you how. And this would be a good segue into Dave Wilder. Because okay. I'm in Spain and I'm starting to get phone calls from Dave Wilder. Oh, that's right. Or oh, wasn't it Dave? Was it Dave Wilder or was it Dave Beakley? It, it might have been both or one of those guys. And and uh, just say it's Wilder. And, and he's like, some French couple keeps phoning me, and it's coming on Cabby's. Uh, they seen something about the uh, phone or whatever. And I'm like, they found Cabby's phone. I'm like, I Dave, you gotta that. call them back. And it turns out not only did they call our friend Dave in Calgary. They phoned um, our friend, probably Dave Beakley in uh, Winnipeg. Right. They called David Ortiz. <laughs> That's right. And they also called your uncle in Trinidad. Right. They called my uncle Llewellyn. So, and my uncle Llewellyn spoke to these French people. And so my uncle Llewellyn is in Trinidad. So he speaks with a certain English patois. So it's kind of a broken English, but he's it's not quite. But he's got an accent and speaking to these French people who don't speak English very well. So they obviously have an accent and they're trying to communicate with each other about my phone. It was a total calamity, but anyway, we found them and they were so nice. And like, and I tried to give them money for finding my phone because I've lost phones before and it's so tragic it, yeah. and they wouldn't take it. And that, you know, I had to pay it forward somehow. And I don't remember how, but that was, uh, so paid it forward to some French girls later. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let's like, so good. Let's go to, okay. So another one of these life changers, Dave Wilder, when we went to Calgary for the first time, Tim McAuliffe, a colleague of ours at the score, said, you gave me a card. He's like, you got to look up this guy. 
He, he just said this guy's name, Doug Donald. You remember the card? I don't know if he gave it to me, but he showed me the card. So I don't remember his name, but when we got to see Mastermind at the radio station in Calgary, I said, Mastermind, I want to go to, we want to go to this place called Cowboys. And he's like, no, you don't. He's like, no, no, we want to go to Cowboys. And then we walked down the hall to another radio station, which was a rock station. And Mastermind leans his head in. He's like, hey, Red Dog, these guys want to go to uh, Cowboys. Can you call your boy Doug, Do call your boy, your people there? He's like, sure. So he set us up with Doug Donald. We get to Cowboys. Life changing. So you, we get to the front. We're like, oh, there's a huge lineup. And, uh, you know, we're like, okay, well, maybe we'll wait in line. But let's just try. We, uh, excuse me, sir, bouncer. Um, <laughs> we're here to see Doug Donald. He's like, Ch -ch -ch. hold on one second. Goes back. Next thing you know, this guy comes out. He's like, fellas. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was like, hey. So he, it kind of has like a raspy kind of a voice. Very nice man. Black cowboy hat, black shirt. We go in and... He takes us on what would probably be our first tour of a bar, and a legitimate tour. And all it means is you go from one bar to the next bar, from that bar to the next bar. And every bar, there's a bunch of drinks for you, and you don't have to pay for them. Right. And every bar was staffed with extremely attractive, buxom women. Buxom, yes. Buxom. They have great curves. So... You know, Dave, I've never worked in a restaurant or a club. When I was in high school, I worked at Wendy's. I worked at uh, Beaver Lumber, which is a hardware store, which that. no longer yeah. exists. And I worked at Canadian Tire. Those are my jobs in high school. What were your jobs? I made salads at the Pickle Barrel for a bit <laughs> <laughs> when I was like 14. That's amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, other jobs. There's like um, this place called the Adventure Zone that I worked at for a, for a long time. Um, did you work? Did you have a job in high? Like, These are all worked? high school jobs. High school, okay. Yeah, and I worked during the summer, and I did like um, in between university, I did uh, some demolition demolition work. Did you really? Yeah, you would just go into a house, and we just like knock down walls and stuff. Really? Yeah, <laughs> okay. I hated that job. <laughs> but it, that's but a, it was good. It was good work. So and 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 then in university, I worked at HMV and a movie theater, and those are my. And then I got a yeah a internship at the score. What did you? What were your? What were your university jobs? When I was at university, I didn't work. Oh, okay. Uh, but, you know, in between, and then I would work in the summer, at summer camp or whatever. So so we never had the bar experience. No, no, no. So now we're getting a tour uh, of this legendary estab establishment called Cowboys in Calgary. You know what? I actually, I need to get Doug Donald on, on the, the podcast, podcast yes, just to tell do. some stories. Because some stories you, I, I really want to tell, I yeah, just like think they're just not, they're not. The time you took us to the midget bar. Yes, in uh, in Phoenix, that was amazing. So so we're going on this tour, and and um, we're like, we gotta come back here and film a segment the next day. You're so stupid. So yeah, so the next day, uh, we're like Doug, or that night we're like Doug, we can we come back and film a segment? He's like, yeah, of course. So then we then following day we come back. We show up at Cowboys, and there are signs on the doors like. When entering the premises, you will be on TV. To, I was like, "Wow, this is like official! Like we're right. just we're just doing this little segment called Cabby on the Street, but like it's like it's an official." But like really, production. all we want to do is get these bartenders on camera because right, we know that they're, they're gold and they're and they're hot and they actually know a thing or two about hockey and Calgary. They they know sports, um, and but, and some <laughs> of them were probably stars in what was um, I think it was, the website was called. Was it called Calgary Girls or was it? No, it was called Fl Flames. Oh, Girls. Flames Girls during their their playoff run. Right. Yeah, their Stanley Cup run of two thousand four, and it was basically girls were just pulling up their tops, and like guys were like, oh, it was like spring break, in I suppose like June or May or June when they were playing the Tampa Bay Lightning in the Stanley Cup final, and th this this story just went across the whole country, and I'm sure some of the staff at Cowboys were one of these girls. Right, they must have started. So we got them on camera. Which is, I mean, I, I say, you know, a stupid idea, but it was actually great because it got so much attention. Right. So, in, in a, so like, so then we would, so and that night we met uh, Doug Donald's right-hand man, a guy named Dave Wilder. And I think we put Wilder in the segment. I don't remember what the first segment was. I just remember him saying he beat his roommate, Jim Taylor, oh, yeah. in PlayStation. I, I think it was NBA Live. Well, uh, I think it was, um, it was Unforgiven. What would you like to be forgiven for? Right, right, it was. And we just got a bunch of bartenders and then Dave Wilder, who that night, I was like, what's your middle name? He's like, Andrew. I'm like, all right, this is Dave Andrew Wilder. And from, 
from then on, he's known as he's now known as Da. I just call DA. him Da. Yep. Um, so that's so then, and then we went back to Cowboys. To, we probably shot another six or seven segments at Cowboys, and now the whole country, if they didn't know before, they really knew about Cowboys, and it got so ridiculous that we once played soccer in the bar against was, the girls yeah. winners lose their tops right so the, <laughs> it was uh, dk myself and da dave wilder were on a team and we just played the bartenders the staff and it was hard to focus because they're in these little tops and shorts and we're you know and uh, it was around the i guess we were doing world cup stuff i guess it was world 2006 was yeah, when world, the, the cup, world cup yeah um and the girls lost and one of the girls uh, as per the rules of the commissioner, Doug Donald took her top off. Of course, I wasn't allowed to show that footage because it was a little too racy for, you know, nightly. I remember like, editing it though. Yeah, that several was, times. Yeah, so you know that that was one of the gifts of being the producers. You get to see all the footage. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you remember that one girl in Boston who showed us? When we went to we went to after the Red Sox won. I wasn't on that trip. Oh, she's I do Brian remember I. looking at the footage though. Yeah. And she wasn't, she, she would not have been, Rogers Santa. <laughs> she would not have made the staff at no. Cowboys. Uh, so when, after the Boston Red Sox won the World Series in 2004, uh, we went to Boston at, to see the fans line up for, for the opening day. And they camped out overnight. And we b- found a bunch of colorful Boston characters. One was this girl who um, showed us um, her breasts. And they weren't that dope. Uh, and she wasn't, so anyway. We did 2006 Stanley Cup, 2007 Ottawa versus the Anaheim Ducks. That's where we met Dustin Penner and Ryan Getzlaff, who I've become very close to both of those guys. And we didn't even, like at the time, you're not even thinking, you're just, we're just doing these silly interviews and guys are responding. I guess the pinnacle, it, it really started to change in 2006, 2008. So now we were following the full Stanley Cup journey. It's my man D my man B, and myself. And when I first started Cabin on the Street, I would have this tagline. I would say, I'm with my man B, I'm with my man D, and I'm gone. My man B was my cameraman, Brian Roy, and D would be off camera doing something, and the ca- he, doing something. I never knew what it was. We'd swing over, and he would, you know, he'd be do- posing on a chair, doing like a karate, a, a crane kick, or he'd be doing something, and that was like part of like, that was like the a little extra pop at the end of the segments. But so now it's 2008 and we're covering the Stanley Cup final. And in the final, the Red Wings beat the Pittsburgh Penguins. And the thing that we would do is like the thing about the playoffs is the stars, like the big A-list stars, aren't always the stars of the series. So we would find other players to interview who would then become the stars because it's a condensed second season. But we got lucky in this regard because... I formed this friendship with Chris Osgood, who was the starting goaltender for the Detroit Red Wings, somehow, and he just and he would just let me interview him in like after the big media scrum. He'd always save some time for me, and I think it became the and it our interviews with athletes changed because and you made this observation when they would see. Their, their friends at home would see these interviews. Like, oh, I saw you with Cabby. And they would get text messages, and that would sort of validate me, and that would sort of co-sign my stuff. So they'd be like, oh, okay, my buddy saw it. They really liked it, as opposed to the traditional interview. So that's when things... Yeah, it was different. It changed. It, it, so we had been going on this pace um, where we'd go and get segments, and we'd try to get athletes. And now, like I said, we would go into the score and try to raise the ante. So raising the ante this time meant going on the road for several weeks at a time, covering the playoffs in a way that nobody we felt had covered it before. So actually talking to players, um, see one of the things that, that bugs me about post-game interviews is they're so boring. They're so um, dry and not memorable. And I had been able to see the cabbie talking to these athletes was able to get a lot more out of them. So now take that and combine it to the NHL playoffs and we believed we could get more out of these guys, show part of the fun of hockey, you know, even during the most intense times, that these guys could laugh and smile and show some of their personality, when, even when the, the most cameras are on them, the most intention was on them, the most pressure was on them, and that 
Cabby could kind of represent the fan in the in the dressing room and and talk to them in the way the fan would talk to them. The real person would talk to them and and ask questions that people might actually want to know. Um, for example, how well do you actually think you played tonight? <laughs> right. And the guys would say, well, I played pretty well. And Cab would say, all right, let's uh, take a report card. And get you to fill it out yourself. Right. That was, uh, Mark Savard did that. He was awesome. Boston, I think it was a Boston and Montreal series. And we made a report card and it was like, you know, skating, effort, performance. And he graded himself. And I think that game they won like 4-1. So he gave him, he, and it was like team grade, individual grade. Uh, that was, and then other times we would just bring the box score. And I would highlight that person's line so they can see their, their minutes and their shots and all that for the first time. And yeah, they, this is the first time they're going to see their own stats, and they would comment, oh, you know, I, I didn't know I did that. I'll give you another example. We were talking about the Stalls before. So Cabby had really formed this relationship with the Stall brothers, and he'd say, you know, I'm part of the family. So Mark Stahl scored the winning goal for the Rangers one game, and since Cab is part of the family, he went in there and he said, let's call Mom. So that's what we did. We called Mark Stahl's mother on speakerphone, and this was the first time he was getting a chance to speak to her since he scored, at that point, the biggest goal of his life. And and she was surprised that he was calling because she's like, I didn't think he would call this early, and, you know, and uh, and he's like, Mom, what did you think of the game? She's like, oh, we're so proud of you. We're so happy that you won. But it, that, I forgot about that. That was a pretty cool moment where he actually got to speak to his mom. And 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 I think this was your idea. I'm pretty sure it was. So, so I'm, I'm in studio with my producer, uh, Dave Crickst, and we, so... I had sort of embedded myself with the family as the fifth Stahl brother. So all all of my <laughs> interactions yeah. with Jordan Stahl, Mark Stahl, and Eric Stahl involved me referencing the family. And every time I would interview these guys, DK's like, you should give them 20 bucks from, for lunch and tell them it's from mom. So every single time I interview one of those three guys, I would start the interview with, Mom told me get mom told me to give you twenty bucks for lunch. And these guys were awesome. Like they would just take the money, put it in their pocket, and act yeah. like thanks. And Jordan would never give the money back. Eric got every no, I think he kept it too. Eric's up like sixty or eighty. No, Eric Eric I gave them I think I was well over and I, I remember finding I didn't find all the clips, but I think I gave him over I think it was about one twenty, Jordan about a hundred bucks because we talked spoke to him a bunch of times during the two thousand eight and two thousand nine. Uh, playoffs and then Mark, I think about sixty bucks. Um, so, <laughs> the, yeah, those dudes. Uh, yeah. So, but then of course, if we're talking about those times, so so ultimately, you're going to the playoffs, and this thing was called Journey to the Cup. So the pressure was to get to the Stanley Cup. What we're going to do with it once we got there, who knew? But so Cab is talking about uh, Chris Osgood because he formed this relationship with Chris Osgood. By the time the cup came, we knew that we had to find Chris Osgood and the Stanley Cup together. And I'll let you take it from there. That was that was like the, we'll get to the Kobe stuff soon, and I want to get to like Will Ferrell. I want to get back to Mike Tyson. Uh, your fight with Dion Phaneuf, I want to get to. <laughs> uh, yeah, I saw a the, picture of you and uh, Alicia. It made me think of that. Right. Um, and there's like, there's, there's I don't know if we'll get to it, but there's a bunch of stuff we're going to yeah. talk about. So I guess mainly it's because of the Kobe interviews, like, people would think that we could do anything because we had done, we had these moments and experiences with these athletes that people hadn't seen before. So during like when the, when the Red Wings won in game six in Pittsburgh, I was like, we, I have to somehow drink from the Stanley cup. Like I have no business drinking from the Stanley cup. Especially after the team just won. I've never seen this before, but we believed that it was possible. Yeah. And we had like somehow some way had to do it. So we're walking through. So and like I wore this yellow poncho with like these um, goggles. With these goggles, I had like a I had a snorkel which I, I later abandoned. But we did some interviews on the ice, and all the guys got familiar with me. And then finally, so we're going into the dressing room. On the way in, I see Nicholas Lidstrom. He has he he's consumed maybe ninety percent of this bottle of champagne. I'm like, how do you feel? He goes, oh, I feel great, bud. How do you feel? I'm like, I feel awesome. Not as awesome as you, but I feel awesome. He's like, do you want some? I'm like, sure. So then he he poured the remainder of the champagne into my mouth. And that like there may have been chunks in it. And I and I drank his backwash. And I <laughs> it didn't matter. That happened. That happened. It was 
it was kind of gross, but it was kind of awesome at the same time. So we go into this room, and this is the old the Mellon Arena, and the dressing rooms for the visitors were terrible. They were tiny. So in this room, there are like 100 dudes. There's like all the guys on the team, all their buddies, their, you know, their family members. And the media. And the media and the team guys. So uh, I think the first person we see was Dominic Hasek. And uh, and he and he and he said uh, we're gonna give champagne to the kids. I'm like real champagne. He goes no no no. We're gonna give them like uh, yeah. He was great. Uh, the fake champagne. Cham- fake champagne like grape juice or <laughs> ginger ale or something. So anyway, so and he tried on your snorkel and bent he, it. That's when you abandoned it after Dominic put it in his put mouth. Put it in his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and he did pour champagne over me. So so later, so I get some interviews and finally Chris Osgood emerges into the second part of the the dressing room. And I'm like, Chris, uh, so I interview him, and I think it was Darren McCarty at the same time. I'm like, Chris, I, I want to drink from the cup. He's like, all right. So he waves for the cup to come over, and then he waves for some champagne to come so, over. But you have to picture this. When somebody waves for the cup to come over and this room is packed, you just see the cup above everybody's head being passed forward until it reaches Chris Osgood. So it finally gets to Chris Osgood. He pours some champagne in the cup. And I start saying something to the camera, like, finally, the journey's over. I'm with my guys. And it, there's no better way to finish it. Like, some, something to that Talk effect. about having to get something right on the first take. Yeah, because that's the only time we're going to get. So he pours champagne into the cup, and then he he tips it up to my mouth. But it wasn't enough. I was like, no, I'm gonna di- higher, higher. So then he pours champagne into my mouth. And I drink the champagne, and I have my famous... You know, my sign off, I'm with my man B, I'm with my man D, and the journey's complete. Something like that. But it was like, but see, I don't know if uh, if it had been, that moment had been captured on camera before with a member of the media. I know that their boys and their families, when they get the cup for a day, mm-hmm. they get to the drink from it. But on TV, that was like, that was like a huge moment where some fat reporter from Toronto, uh, you know, gets to drink from this cup that, you know, I didn't. We'll kind of celebrate with the players. So this journey was complete at that moment. So what I believed, if you were the fan who'd been through the whole thing, this is the point that the fan got to celebrate with the players for the first time and not just, you know, say, how does it feel? We know how it feels. You want to know how it feels. Right. So you are experiencing how it feels instead of just asking a player how it feels. Um, That was a difference for me. And I, I tend to kind of soak all this stuff in hyperbole, but... um. That's how it, it kind of comes through in my mind eventually. All right, so let's tell this Dion Phaneuf story real quick. So Dion Phaneuf will segue us into Red Bull. You, we, did, before we get there, just one quick thing. You, we, we drank from the cup. You drank from the cup. And then the next week, what was in our hands? Oh, yeah. That, the Larry yeah, O'Brien Brian trophy. I forgot about that. Yeah, then we went to see. Talk about the, unprecedented. Yeah, there was, it was, it was uh, the Boston Celtics won in game six in Boston versus the LA Lakers 08 and we'd formed a, a special bond with Kobe but we're in the dressing room and I remember interviewing Rajon Rondo who I tried who I think I made laugh once before and then he smiled in that interview obviously he was elated and Glenn Big Baby Davis was like Canada already drunk like we're in the tra- the dressing room like 30 minutes after the mm-hmm. after the win and he's already drunk and I'm holding, we're both holding the Larry O'Brien trophy. So I'm not sure if anybody has been able to do that, cover the Stanley Cup final, drink from that, and then hold the Larry O'Brien trophy, which is the NBA championship trophy. But that was... Um, which that was, which pretty, have, was presented to us by Donnie Wahlberg from the New Kids on the Block. Right. And which is, how did we meet Donnie Wahlberg? Do we meet him there that night? Uh, that's a good question. I think we met him, um, wherever we met him, yeah, we did. We went to go interview him post because we needed someone to talk to post uh one of their wins. Yeah, we needed to talk to someone post the game. And Donnie's like, Hey Cabby and you're like shaking your head, like, What? And you're like, Yeah, I'm filming in Toronto. I used to watch you all the time. Right. So that and then he brought Joe McIntyre in the interview. So that's where we met Donnie Walbert. He was shooting a couple of the Saw movies, I think, in, yeah. in Toronto. So he gave us some great sound bites and then like fast forward to like a year or two later, DK and I are at a New Kids on the Block concert in at the Air Canada Center, like third row, on our phones for 90 straight minutes as these guys perform to 20,000 screaming women. And we were guests at Don Wahlberg. Yeah. 
But, you know, and, and it was, you know, it was I, I looked up a few times and I'm like, oh, these guys really have a command of the audience. But I wasn't really trying to sing. Neither was. So we're Let's just, skip past this part. Okay, okay fine. Okay, fine. So, so then, uh, okay. Ottawa. No, oh, DMFNF. Ottawa, I think this is 09. 07 or 09. Right. We're there for flu talk. And we go. If there's to, ever a part two of this, we'll talk about the relationship with Red Bull and. and We'll talk about I wanted I wanted to say the one the one our introduction to Kenny Mac. I wanted to say that one one part. So we're at a dinner with uh, in Ottawa, and we're there with Red Bull covering this, event. <laughs> and we're in this private room and we're all loud and boisterous. There's like nine or ten of us at this table, and uh, so we're talking about Red Bull athletes. And Dion Phaneuf was one of the first, it, like it was the first hockey Red Bull athlete, because uh, Red Bull had their athletes were generally in. Um, sort of the extreme sports world and they were um, forming partnerships with athletes in sort of the traditional four, sport, four sports. So what did you say to him to get him angry with you? <laughs> so we're at this steak dinner and uh, it was a great dinner. Wet Rebel does it right and I'm sitting at this long table and across from me is Dion Phaneuf. And we're, I like to engage these guys and talk about things that I find are interesting and we were talking about with Red Bull the fact that they sponsored Dion Phaneuf and I thought that was awesome I really did I thought that Red Bull going out of their traditional market into more mainstream sports was cool and um, I said kind of offhand you know I think that's really good and and they should even get some more hockey players in there and he's, he kind of turned around no no you were like you were like, <laughs> you said it was like uh it's not like they didn't try to get other guys. Something to, <laughs> something to that effect. Like so, I thought I said that I thought they should get other guys. He's like, what? I'm like, well, you know, it would make sense. Like a bunch of hockey players. He's like, no, they just want me. I said, you're telling me that if they wanted Alex Ovechkin, uh, they wouldn't take him. Nope, they just want me. I'm like, you're crazy. <laughs> if Alex Ovechkin was approached by Red Bull, uh, and, and he said yes, they would take him in a second. And he's like, nope, they just want me. So that so Phaneuf got took exception to to DK's questioning of his talent or his celebrity or whatever it was, and he got pretty fired up. But we had to like calm the situation down, and eventually there was everything was fine. But yeah, I do I do remember. Yeah, but Cavi thought it was funny. So the next time we saw him, it was in Vancouver for uh, EA Sports NHL 12 or whatever, right? NHL 10, and um, Cavi's like, I got a present for you, Dion. And then Dion's like, well, I don't know what you what are you gonna do, Cavi? And then he's like sits me down next to Cabby. He's like, you guys are going to fight each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's so right. We yeah, fought yeah. each other in NHL 10, and I beat him twice. <laughs> so then I thought he forgot about it until um, the All-Star game last year, and I see Jamie McLennan Noodles from TSN, who used to play for the Calgary Flames. He's like, D, come here, come here. I want to introduce you to someone. And so he introduces me to Dion, and Dion turns around and he goes, I know you. <laughs> I go. He goes. I goes. Don't think I forgot. He goes. It's all wonderful. <laughs> Something like it's all water under the bridge now. But I'm like, that's great. Noodles, as a side note, is the MC for Dion's wedding. Oh, nice. Which is, I don't know if I, I'm not allowed to say it, but it's because Alicia just told. Me, hey, I almost anyway. Never. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Dion. No so offense, man. I'm just right now. I'm gonna clear the air. Let's squash it. <laughs> Squashed. Yeah. Squash. Squash. Hey, so uh, the first time we meet, so Red Bull, we were able to go on like all these amazing trips on these awesome Red Bull events. We got to go to Europe a few times um, and uh, all across Canada. South Africa. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. We went to South Africa with Red Bull, yeah. of course, with their, um, what was the name of that event? It just is terrible, but it was like a freestyle, freestyle soccer, soccer yeah. event. Um, and the first time we meet the, this guy who was like, I don't even know what Kenny Mac's or Kenny McIntyre is his name, but we call him Kenny Mac. I don't really know what his title is. It's like culture ambassador or something like that. Or called. So we're in Quebec City oh, yeah. at an event called Crash Dice. And this is the first and this is like oh five or oh six the first time we go to it. And we're coming back from a club. It was either Shea Maurice or the Dago Bear. No, we're is that or did we meet him the night that we went to the big event? What do you mean? You know the final event at the end of, and it was like at that army base. No, no, no. Oh, do we meet him there? We, well, we met no, him. No, it was the first. No, it was because we were staying at the Capitol uh, Hotel, which was the first hotel we stayed at when, the first time we attended that event. I remember mm -hmm. we were at that hotel, but no, we came back. There was like eight of us walking back from 
the Dagobera, let's say. Mm -hmm. And Kenny was like a huge prankster. So he got one of his colleagues' room keys. So we go to his room. Eight dudes at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Empty out the mini bar. And then I'm like, I I'm going to get out of here because it's just like... Now, they just started like, whatever line was there with you don't cross with your friends, they... They, it didn't exist for these guys. They they emptied out his mini bar. They uh, did things to his his contact lenses. Yeah. They so they put this is this is the this is the worst one to me. They put gin in his contact lens solution, and I was like, dude, you you guys are like that's that's awful. Like that is like that's really cold. That's not like funny. Like oh yeah, you guys like moved my stuff around. Like. They're they're trying to hurt their friends. <laughs> yeah. So then you stayed. Didn't they move all of the I furniture? All his stuff out of there. And not only that, they left him with just like his bed. And in the bed, because they knew he was just going to come out and pass out regardless, was a condom that they'd filled with some <laughs> white. Like hand cream. Yeah. Hand cream. <laughs> <laughs> just on his pillow. So, but also, but then they put his phone under his bed and kept calling his phone <laughs> i don't know and but that's amazing if they did that i think they did Kenny mac did like at this time black bears are really big and everyone had kind of had the same black bear the one with that ball yes yes the tr yeah the, the tracker or whatever but kenny mac had an extra one that was shattered so he would say can i borrow your cell phone for a sec and then he'd be like oh fuck i just dropped it and he'd pick it up and give them back the shattered one all the time <laughs> And people would lose their mind because they think that they're 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 something. He would broken. also take people's uh, cell phones and just start um, coming out of the closet to all their friends via BBM message. Yeah, and he would send a huge. Yes, <laughs> I got one of those once. Yeah. It was like, hey, I'm running like uh, a half marathon. I want I need your support <laughs> with this. You know, like uh, I'm I'm doing it tomorrow. And I, I remember getting one from a guy. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I didn't even know you're gay, but yeah, yeah sure, whatever. Congrats. But he would, yeah, he would, if you ever gave him your phone, you knew that something bad was going to happen. Or he would change your BBM profile picture to something very sexually gross. Uh, or excrement. Or, yeah, or <laughs> excrement. Yeah. So Kenny Mac, shout out to you. Yeah, shout out to Oliver. Um, sh oh, Oliver what? His uh, child. No, it's, uh, no, it was, it was uh, his, his. Uh, oh, Otis, Otis. Otis, yeah. and I think Tucker is. Otis it? and Tucker McIntyre. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you want, okay, so should we tell. Will Ferrell, and then get to Kobe, or maybe we right end on Kobe. Yeah, or, so but, Will Ferrell is real good. It's real quick in a way. It's just Cabby had interviewed Will Ferrell before. We saw him at the HBO party at an amazing restaurant in Vegas, which was the. Um, we were at the with the Wolf Wolfgang Puck's restaurant at the MGM. Interviewing some cool people. In walks this guy in a fur coat. So this is this is what this is what they would this is what they would do. This is very smart. HBO would invite actors and entertainers to attend the fight and it was we saw Manny Pacquiao destroy Oscar De La Hoya we saw it live but they invite him there because that's where they would get their tickets so they could say on the on the like on an invitation yeah these people are going to show up because that's where they would come and pick up their tickets so these people would show up so you know we inter we interviewed some baseball players we spoke to Bernard Hopkins but we were really waiting for yeah, Reggie Farrell. Miller there he was there it was good um, but then Will Ferrell shows up in a full length fur coat, a fedora, and these sunglasses that flipped open. Uh, they were terrific. They <laughs> and uh, so so I, I approach, so I'm with a, a, it's a, it's a, with a camera guy, not my man B at this time, but with my, with uh, DK here, uh, Dave Cricks, my, my longtime producer who's in studio with me. So I approach Will. I'm like, hey, Will, my name's Cabby. I interviewed you in Toronto uh, when you're promoting... Um, the Jackie Moon movie, which, uh, what was it called again? Oh, the basketball movie? Semi-Pro. Yeah, when semi -pro. you were promoting Semi-Pro, would you like, can I, can I, you know, interview you really quick? And he's like, I'm only going to do the interview in the bathroom. I'm like, all right, cool. Cabby, without hesitation, all right, cool, boys, let's go. So, next thing you know, we're following him into the bathroom. We try to go to the women's bathroom first. It's locked. So we go to the men's and it's like, it's like a one seater. It's not like a, you know, a bathroom with a bunch of stalls. It's one toilet. So there are four grown men in this bathroom. Will Farrell. All myself, I do, the first thing I do is just lock that door. <laughs> Dave and my camera guy. So then I'm interviewing Will Farrell about uh, his love of boxing, which Yeah, he, Cab, I'll say this about this. You not only did you interview him about his love of boxing, you went back and forth with him 
in the right way, and, and this is one of the most impressive times I've ever seen you kind of improv with somebody because you didn't try to one-up Will Ferrell. You can't in that moment, no. No, what you did was you played off Will Ferrell and you set him up to, to have the punchlines. And to me, that was just the perfect thing to do. And I think he appreciated it because you weren't nervous. You didn't have time to get nervous. Yeah, I, you're right. You just looked him straight in the eye and you rolled with these these questions about boxing boxing and then about uh, then about his like punching him in the face you're right and then he pretended to punch him right in in, in the balls but uh and then about his jacket and training yeah and his jacket and his, his fur coat and he said and then you said it needed a per plus bath it was like, <laughs> yeah it was great it was it was perfect and um what was good about it is i think that he appreciated that you weren't nervous talking to him you went toe to toe that know? was that was one of the big ones that yep. that was like I've been nervous a few times. I've been nervous interviewing Jay Z, very uh, nervous interviewing my. And I remember the Jay Z ones weren't good because I was like fumbling. My, I was flustered. It was like this is Jay Z, someone who I revere. Interviewing Michael Jordan was a big, and we we will come back and, and talk about that one, or you'll c come back and talk about that one. Um, and there there are a bunch of other stories. I remember that I just wrote this one down. Remember that time we were in New Orleans for the NBA All Star game, and Shaq gave you like a. We're walking home from an ESPN party. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes there's like that eight-year-old kid in you, and just like we go to these events, and they're very cool, and you want to be professional. But we were walking down the street, and there's Shaq just with his, uh, I don't know if the window was open or if he had like a uh, top down on his car. And I'm just like, I need to go just give him a high five, touch those <laughs> giant paws. You know, we'd spoken to Shaq before, and he'd been on the segment, but this was no camera, whatever. I'm just like, Shaq in the middle of New Orleans, I just want a high five. And he's in a Big ass Rolls Royce and just like, how you doing? <laughs> hey, <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> it was What's amazing. Yeah. Um. So that. So that. We'll give you. Uh. So that. I wish you were in. Um. Sorry to to cut you no off, worries. but I wish you were at that Charles Barkley birthday party because you would have loved it. Oh my gosh, that's right. You would have loved it. I was just Didn't so. Did you bored. get on stage with? Charles? Yeah. Well, I was bored. So like, it was Charles Barkley's birthday recently, his fiftieth. It's and the same weekend as Michael Jordan's birthday, yeah. so he gets it's, which sucks because then he gets. Flo Rida just performed, and I was with a bunch of people from MLSC, and I was just bored. And so it's like, a TNT party, right? Yeah. So I'm like, I'm gonna jump on stage and hug Charles. I just told the one guy sitting next to me, he's like, No, you're not. Next thing you know, I disappeared, and he saw me running on stage towards Charles, and two massive security guys pulled me off. Before and, you could get to Charles. Before I could get to Charles, but because I was wearing my media pass, they didn't know what to do with me. And they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, nothing. I was just saying hi to Charles. They're like, how did you get here? I'm like, I just walked on. And they're like, okay. And so they just left me on stage. <laughs> did and you go hug Charles or go? Yeah, I, eventually I hugged Charles. But there was a, I mean, I've shown you the pictures. Literally, it's just me and Charles on stage. So I was dancing and Charles was DJing. And then eventually he warmed up and whatever. I got to hug him. But there was no reason for me to be up there. So the, uh, so the, and that weekend we did a pretty cool event with uh, LeBron James yes. and uh, Kobe Bryant. Which... So this is a good uh, segue to Kobe. So we'll tell, I'll tell you, tell the uh, the Kobe Bryant sort of saga and I'll tell you like each part very quickly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the first time I meet uh, Kobe Bryant was, I remember the date, it was December 15th, 2005. It was a cold day. It was, and there was a snowstorm in Toronto and Kobe was wearing a huge parka, and he wasn't in a good mood. It was after practice, and we were doing a bit about bandwagon fans. And we got some of the L.A. Kings. Uh, it was uh, Mike, uh, not Mike Comrie, Craig Conroy was in the bit. Yeah. Jeremy Roenick was in the bit. Phil Jackson was in the bit, and Kobe Bryant. So go up to the Kobe. The idea was that they would, because I mean, we all talk about the bandwagon, but what does the bandwagon look like? We wanted them to draw it. Yeah, so I had a sketch pad and a, a Sharpie, which I got Phil Jackson to actually draw the bandwagon. And actually, I I touched him. I hugged him. I put my arm around him, and that's when he was, he told me not to touch him. It was yeah. one, of, one of my most <laughs> embarrassing moments ever. I had this thing where I'd like to disarm my guests by touching them, uh, just to tell them, like, hey, we're, we're, like, we're just regular people. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so... Kobe, I was nervous because this is the first time I'm really seeing Kobe Bryant and up close and I'm, I'm talking to him. So we do the bit and he didn't draw, but just as a, as a throwaway line, Dave sort of just said in my ears, like, see if he'll um, let us stay in the guest house. And actually, he said that to me before I, I, I walked up to Kobe Bryant. So at the end of the bit, as this a throwaway thing, I'm like, hey, Kobe, um, 
we have I have money to get like I have taxi money to get to your place, but is it okay that the next time I'm in Los Angeles we can stay in your guest house? And he looked at Cap and like, "Want to stay at the guest house?" Yeah, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'd stay at Casa de Brian." He's like, "All right, All right man, you can stay at the guest." And this is like the first time, or second time he smiled in the interview. So then later that day, um, well, the cool thing about basketball is you can interview the players at practice, and unlike any other sport, real uh, baseball is kind of like that. You can interview them about 45 minutes before the game. There is media availability. Now, Kobe doesn't really do that, but you can bring a, a camera into the locker room and you can talk to players. So I followed up with Kobe. I was doing another piece about posters, and I followed up with Kobe. I'm like, at the end of it, I was like, hey, Kobe, um, we're going to plan a trip to Los Angeles. I need your phone number. Uh, or what's your address? Yeah. And he's like, you want my address? I'm like, yeah, what's your address? So he, and, he, and, he's, and now he's starting to walk out of the room, and he looks back. He's like, it's 8 Out of Your Mind Avenue. I'm like, okay, Kobe, I'll see you later. <laughs> and uh, so that was, that was December. Then um, Went to the All-Star Game. We went to the All-Star Game in Houston that year. Uh, and, um, and so again, there's multiple media availability. So I'm, I'm doing a bit about why things are bigger in the state of Texas. Again, at the end of the bit, I'm like, Kobe, I went to that address, but you know, I Googled it or I went to MapQuest back when MapQuest was the, right. that was the search engine for driving directions. It was yeah. MapQuest. I went to your house. You weren't there. Um, what's your phone number? He's like, you want my phone number? I was like, yeah. He goes, here, here it is. This is 1-800, never, ever 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 call me ever i'm like okay so it's a okay so i could i could long you. distance number yeah i was like long, you, you, i could reach you on my cell phone he's like yeah try that one a day later i go back i uh i say hey Kobe, the the uh the number didn't work um <laughs> he's like you check your cell phone plan man yeah. <laughs> i'm like uh, maybe it's because i used my cell phone yeah. i and he goes i see that's your problem you got to use a landline I'm like, sorry, what's the number again? He goes, oh, yeah, it's 1-800-JUST-DON'T-CALL-ME. Right. So uh, then we pitched to our boss, like, hey, can we do a, a trip to Los Angeles? Well, we found out. What we didn't know is that people actually, I don't, I don't think we realized that people, there are certain things that they remember more than they remember. And that specific line of Kobe saying, never, ever, ever call me, stuck with people. And yeah. so wherever Cabby would go, and I probably saw more than, than anything else, it would change at first, it'd be like Cab. I love that street hockey stuff, and then it would be like Cab. You know, uh, before you know it, it was like Cab. I love it when Kobe says, uh, "Never, ever, ever call me." And so we knew that it stuck with people. So well, it's something to grow on. Um, so Cab uh, went to our boss, and he said, "We'd like to go to Los Angeles and try go to Kobe's house." So we were there, and I we always like to bring props, um, and I'm not sure if it was a conscious thing back then. But um, but with Kobe, certainly props. But, like, I mean, we use props a little bit more now. But maybe that was the beginning of, of bringing props into things. Maybe we had before. But uh, We our, did before. If you go back to the, the NHL 2002 awards. Oh, we brought a trophy. You had a trophy. Oh, my gosh. I forgot about that. We always brought something if we, if we could. Um, wow, I forgot about that. And, and, and so – and. I know I mentioned it at the beginning of this podcast. Uh, Dave's idea for Cabbie on the Street Hockey was the segment that people remembered for years. Was we were just we didn't know any better. We waited for red lights. We'd play at the busiest in intersections in Toronto, and I would just challenge random people. A game up to one. Dave was the goalie, and I would just play them. And that bit was spoke to Canadians in some way. Yeah, yeah. and and we <laughs> eventually. We believe after that there was even like a street hockey show that someone started. And, oh, the, yeah, there was. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we did that. We did that in 02. I remember we played in front of Maple Leaf Gardens. We yeah. played on King Street. We played in front of Wayne Gretzky's uh, restaurant. So anyway, so now we're so now we go to L.A. for the first time to sit down with Kobe Brown. We get 10 minutes with him at the practice facility in El Segundo. I bring some pillows and a CD for the sleepover. So at the end of the uh, and Kobe kind of took offense to me bringing pillows because you don't, don't think have I pillows in my house. You don't think I have pillows in my house. You don't think I, you don't you think I, <laughs> you don't toiletries think I have in my house. Yeah. <laughs> so um, at the end, I was like, "Hey, Kobe, so like, like what what is your address?" And he's like, "All right, I'll give you an address." And I'm like, "Okay, okay." So I'm writing it down. He goes, "It's one, two, five, one, Compton Boulevard." I'm like, okay. Um, are there? Is there? Is there? Is there a gate? Like, are there? Are there? Is it a gated community? He's like, yeah. There's some gates. There's some gates up. 
And I said, well, what time should I meet you? He's like, um, like 1 a.m. And the, I mean, the, th- the thing that was great about Kobe, and I, I think the reason I was able to connect with him so well is because, you know, Dave was coming up with these concepts for these interviews that people hadn't seen before and certainly not with Kobe Bryant, who at the time had taken, had gone through obviously his, uh, the thing with, uh, you know, his... He was in court and the public perception of Kobe was, was, he was a villain. Yeah, he was. And, and here I am, you know, just not just, I'm just trying to show his personality because the only personality we knew about Kobe was that on the court, he was the most tenacious uh, basketball player, and that he fought with Shaq, and yeah. that, like you know, he, Shaq was doing raps about him. Like that would never happen now, right? So um, we go to this, we go to this address the next the next morning at like eleven o'clock. We go to Compton, and Compton Boulevard has a West and an East. So we just guess, like ah, let's just go to Compton West. So I'm with my man Dave and my camera guy Randy, and we pull up to the address, and it's a church. Mm-hmm. So we get out of the car and there are these dogs, like these junkyard dogs that are just barking at us close to this church. So we walk up to the church. I'm like, I guess this is it. So we go into the church and I didn't want to. This is the beauty. So this is not rehearsed. So, you know, Randy just turns on his camera and Cabby just walks up to the lady in the church and he says, is Kobe here? And she's like, no, Kobe's, Kobe's not here. Kobe lives in Newport Beach. I'm like, oh, is because uh, Kobe said um, I was to meet him here. She's like, no, Kobe's not here. And I kind of look around a little bit more. And then I was like, oh, he's not here. So that that was um, that was among the men. And then the next the next interview, uh, I cut him a, a key for my place because I always wanted to stay at his place. And I extended the invitation to my place. I cut him a key and then I gave him pajamas. That was in 2007. And that's the one that Kobe remembers when he sees me is the pajamas. Mm-hmm. Uh, so got those pajamas you gave me. <laughs> and then But I actually think he took it home because I think he even referenced it recently with his daughter and she's like, Yeah, what are those pajamas? Yeah, it's this is a strange it's just a strange thing for for Kobe to hang on to was a grown man giving another grown man pajamas. Maybe it's because it's so weird is the reason why he did hang on to them. Um and then uh We brought a limo the next year. We brought a limo and then the big one is the or, or the one that people remember the most, I think was um, I went to I went to host an event for Kobe, uh, and he was doing a video game thing with Carmelo Anthony. And they were playing one of the NBA games, and at, I was sitting with Kobe. And this is one of the few times I've actually been able to hang out with Kobe Bryant. So we're just talking. He's asking about my family and my summer. This is like August, and I think before I went, Dave and I were just talking about it, and it was it was like we weren't. I wasn't shooting a segment. I was just going to host this event. And then we we're like, what, what, what the hell are we gonna do next with Kobe Bryant? And uh, the idea was about a helicopter. And Dave was like, we'll rent one of these, you know, huge like helicopters, and and we'll just do a tour of the city or something. Mm-hmm. So I say to Kobe, I'm like, hey Bean, uh, and I like calling him Bean because that's his middle name. I'm like Bean, uh, I got an idea for the next interview. He's like, all right, what is it? I'm like, well, let, let's just, um, can we just ride around in a helicopter and he's like okay and i was shocked that he responded so quickly to it and i was shocked that he said yes um so i said to his manager jerry i'm like jerry he said he would do it i look over to allison who was on the pr lakers pr staff i'm like kobe said he would do the helicopter thing i didn't know that kobe had a helicopter nope. himself that was the thing so we were going to spend oh, a few thousand I was bucks looking at spending in the score i was like that's too much money we can't afford to buy a helicopter i'm like well, well maybe the helicopter if we put their website up on the screen will let us use it yeah so it turns out kobe had his own helicopter so on the morning that we're we're going to this small airport in in uh in uh, santa ana california we're, we're running, running late <laughs> we're running late and the pr director we're texting each other she's like where are you I can't believe you're late. I'm like, no, 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 we're like two minutes away. And we get there. And Kobe's not there yet. But Kobe was like, Kobe was like, hey, make sure these guys are on time. So she's stressed out. She's stressing me out. I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, we're late. Can you imagine missing that opportunity? Oh, like just seeing him fly away. So we get to we get to the airport and Kobe and we get to this little red helicopter. Kobe gets to the airport and he's <laughs> he gets this golf cart and he's being carted out to the out to the helicopter. We kind of say what's up. And, I, and we're like, can't believe this is happening. So we get into the helicopter, and I have some. I say something like, you know, from the from the locker room to the court, to the to the 
practice facility to now we're in the helicopter. So Dave and I, we, we lift off. And it's the, it's just, there's four of us. There's the pilot, there's Kobe in the front seat, Dave on to my right, and I'm behind Kobe Bryant. And this is the era, the era where we had like a, remember we had the flip cams? Yep, we which were, were huge. Because right before our cell phones were really good with video, I say right before, like I'm speaking of ancient history, like three well, years ago before. But that's kind of ancient yeah. history in technology terms. Yeah. These flip cans were, gave us HD quality video in our hand. So we, so I'm recording this conversation with Kobe, and I think you said later, like that day, you're like, do you remember what we did today? Like it was, it was, yeah, kind, it was, it was insane. surreal. And I, and it wasn't really taking it in, in the moment that we're flying in a helicopter with Kobe Bryant. So we land, we land at JFK, and so uh, there's a driver there to pick Not up. JFK. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, LAX. LAX, and uh, another three-letter acronym. Yeah. We land at LAX. But you just know you're gonna email Cabby. It was not JFK. Yeah, that you yeah. Landed someone's at. gonna hit me up yeah. on Twitter. Um, and so he has a driver drive him from LAX to the practice facility in El Segundo, which is like a 10-minute drive. So in the on that drive is probably the most relaxed that I am with with Kobe. So we're just talking, and Dave is recording this on a flip cam about various things. And I'm like, Kobe, I feel so comfortable here that I'm like, you know, I'm like, uh, when I'm in Los Angeles, I feel like I'm on part of your family. And you're like, and then Kobe's like, yeah, you're like the awkward, weird uncle, uh, like the cousin that nobody really wants to talk to. That's kind of what, how you are. Um, so the, the, the jokes continue. And then later that night, he hits a game-winning shot over Dwayne Wade, and it just kind of encapsulated this piece. That was like, I, and here's the weird thing, DK. Um, that's one of the interviews people reference, probably the interview people reference the most on uh, on all the stuff, all the interviews that we've done. And I hope that's not the pinnacle. Like, I hope that's not the career achievement, because like, I don't want to be on the downside of the thing. I don't want. I want to. I, there, there are other things that we can do that we will no, do. No, but we talk about it all the time. First of all, when it comes to Kobe, when we do Kobe again, we already know what we're gonna do. Yes. So we have the idea. You know, without letting people in um, to the idea, uh, it's good. I think. I think it's a great, yeah, it's a solid idea. But we, we're already aiming higher at different things. So you know, look forward for Cabby and Obama coming to you soon. <laughs> But That's, you know, we 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 set the the thing. You know, there's guys out there that I think we never know what people are going to catch up, catch on to. But we're going to keep trying to do things with people that I think people will eventually um, kind of find cool. Like for example, the one see the way we come up with ideas, and I, I kind of call it the never ending conversation. We're always throwing things back and forth. And recently, during a text message conversation, I think we found one of those things. Oh, your idea is brilliant. Like we, you're talking about the Aaron Rodgers one. Yeah. Okay. We can, well, we can't say what it is, but it's, yeah. It was when when we fire ideas back and forth, they usually will come up with something that we think is either clever or think that's like is pretty cool. But it's like the never ending conversation of brainstorming that just always continues. So, um, okay. So I wrote down Mike Tyson about an hour ago. So let's. So we, we'll circle back and end with Mike Tyson. But mm-hmm. before we get to Mike Tyson. What, uh, what is the, what is the, what's the worst interview that you remember? The worst interview yeah. that I remember? Give me the, give me the worst. Like the, the one that you're like, mm, that one, that's like, that one, that one was, that one didn't. Oh, one didn't. yeah, no, okay. That's actually, I was, I was like, yeah, I want to search too hard for this, but there was one, um, was, who was it again? In I don't the, know. I don't Rangers. know if ours might be different. It was in the Rangers dressing room. Was it Yaga or was it Chris Jury? It was Chris Jury. Chris Jury, yeah. Not yeah. a fan. He was not a fan. Oh, he just me. seemed way too annoyed. That or Amari Stoudemire in Phoenix yeah. walking off. So, so the so the Drury one was, I come up to him and he's like, "Are you gonna ask me stupid questions again?" I'm like, "Yeah." And he's like, "I don't want to. I don't want to do any stupid questions." I'm like, "Okay, well, I'll ask you some non-stupid ones." Or so, I said something. We did the interview, but he was definitely not interested. No, oh, he's just a. Yeah. yeah I and, don't mind saying that. And uh, and then. Uh, Amari Stoudemire, we were doing a bit about gambling on the plane, and I had made some kind of comment about has about him losing large sums of money, which would then contribute to his teammates' kids 
college funds. Right, but you also talked about his tattoos and you got sensitive about his tattoos. It was that was that's what it was? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was because he's he lost a lot on the plane. Well, you asked him about like one of the Bible scriptures on his arm or something. Oh, I oh, see I yeah, I'm glad you I forgot. So anyway, Amari, not happy, walked out of the interview. I remember he, he looked over to Le- Le- Leandro Barbosa. Just I get the top of his lungs. What is this? Yeah. Like, what, what the what hell's going on, that? LB? Yeah. What is this it LB? Yeah. Um, so those are my two that stand out. But I, that's just on the athletes. It was, it is what it is. It happens sometimes. Um, and then what's what's the one that was the best one? We want to what... the the to me. Yeah. I mean, watching you with Will Ferrell to me stands out. And I, and I said, I always said it before because it just the essence of you going back and forth with somebody and just being able to do it and just performing at your peak, like you were on your game. Thanks, man. Uh, that that to me just will always stand out um, of your natural talent. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. That's that's, that's that was a, that was a that's a big one. I have I have never seen. I haven't and seen. I've watched it so many times. I want to cut <laughs> that one into different things. <laughs> yeah, you you um, cut that one. I love I love the intro. That was excellent. Um, but uh, but I'll also say recently that um, when I saw you with the energy that you brought to the Kobe and LeBron thing was. That's a, like we talk about stepping up like an athlete. Again, you stepped up on that one and really brought it. Like it's just uh, that's what makes you unique. That certain energy. We got. I think I got lucky that day that those guys were both in a great mood. Uh, I've never seen them laugh like that. You got more out of them than I've ever seen before. So that one, that was so. That was a really strong. Another and then another podcast will uh, will describe what that process was, uh, working with the people at Sprite and trying to and just we. I think we had. I think we came up with like twenty five or thirty individual ideas for what we yeah. could do with Kobe and LeBron and they finally settled on one and, and, and we got lucky that it worked out pretty mm-hmm. well. Um, finally, just one last thing. The, the thing you did with the reporters recently I also really enjoyed because there was a new side of you in a way interacting with these old school reporters that we've kind of stayed away from for a long, long time. I know. I was filling in for, and shout out to Michael so, Landsberg who lets me fill in for him from time to time. But we talk about crossing lines all the time. That to me was another line that was crossed where these kind of old school reporters, some of them in the Hall of Fame or whatever, where we always felt like the outcast were accepting Cabby into their fraternity in a way without, I hate saying this, like, you know, we've, we've been through so much where people, reporters, especially in media, were not on our side. Agreed, yes. So to see... We, it, looked, we looked different, we dressed different, we were a lot younger than most beat reporters, right. so our, our whole vibe and what we... When we did, our interviews were just a lot different than the traditional meeting. Right. So for me to produce that show and have you host and have them kind of talk to you with a respect and admiration, you know, to the point where they even have given us ideas for, for segments. Yes. Uh, was different and cool. Thank you to Michael Farber. And I also want to say thank you to Steve Ludzig, who gave us. So uh, yeah. so th- this is the other one that's referred to the most. It's it's uh, It's the Kobe interviews and then. Uh, Steve Ludzig once told Dave, he's like, you should do a segment about how hockey players tape their knobs. And that's all he said. And when Dave told me that, I was like, that's amazing. Yeah. And that one could be the funniest segment we've ever done. Yeah, and I think that's important that people know that we we do think of a lot of the ideas, but we also listen to what other people say. Um, because there are some great ideas that people have. And that that was, okay, I want to quick, before we get to Mike Tyson, I just want to, what what I in my this is where my brain goes. My brain was we're in the chopper with Kobe Bryant. I didn't really take it in as a surreal moment, but I remember. I think this is the only time I've ever said this to you. When after the L.A. Kings won the Stanley Cup final, the Stanley Cup uh, this this year was June something. I think it was the eleventh or something. That day or that when they won, I, we were scrambling on the ice to find interviews, and then you were like, "We got to get one of these guys on off the record tomorrow." And I was like, all right, cool. So I fire out five text messages to the guys. I fire them to Dustin Penner, Jared Stoll, Mike Richards, Jeff Carter, Drew Doughty. And I remember on the ice, I say to Penner, I'm like, hey, man, can you come on off the record tomorrow? And then Penner's like, I don't even know where I'm going to be tomorrow. Yeah. And then <clears throat> so I, sh- I shoot these guys text messages. I'm like, please, get, can you guys just for like five minutes just do a quick thing? So the next morning, all the guys are at Jared Stoll's place. And um, and the 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 Kings aren't doing media for like seventy two or ninety six hours, and so Stoli 
gets uh, Dave gets a text from Jared Stoll like, hey, uh, when you guys come by, the cup might be here. We show up at Jared Stoll's place. Our camera guy's there, and the Stanley Cup is just in his backyard. Well, his front yard where his pool is. And we're like, oh, my gosh, the yeah. Stanley Cup's here. Like, the Stanley Cup's going to be in the shot. Yeah. So Dustin Penner and Jared Stoll do the interview, and Matt Green is in the background just cracking. Like, he's performing for everybody there and trying to ruin the interview by just cracking jokes off camera. It's a, actually pretty fun, funny. But, like, these, like, because we developed these relationships with these players, we got to have this exclusive this 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 opportunity that no one else was granted and i remember saying to you dk i was like i'm going to remember this one for a really long time yeah and just being in that moment i was like holy this is this is this is pretty cool like yeah. two two dudes that you know frig you were working demolition one summer i was friggin selling dvds at hmv and then fast forward you know we're just in this yeah i go back to script writing with wade <laughs> that's really where I start when we were writing scripts and just Cabby would just like we had just had good printing but Cabby had better printing and he had what? good stats and stuff <laughs> and we would give Martin and Greg our, our our highlights or whatever and they would read them and that was our job at the score at, at then I guess it was the score then maybe maybe headline sports when we yeah. first started in the business was writing scripts for the host to read the highlights yeah, and, and I would work hit... at the fan during the day and people would be like they would make fun of the segment. They'd be like, "Ah, Cavi segment. That's just stupid. Whatever." Yeah. It, 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 it was stupid for a while. It wasn't not stupid, but it just it just took a while for people to get used to it. I think. Yeah, which I always say that you know people are more fond of things when they look back on them. Yeah, there is there is a certain romanticism to when you look back at whatever. And we'll end with this. Okay, so we started with Mike Tyson. How you got the Mike Tyson interview, and then we're at his house, um, and we're you know, and and it doesn't look like the house from the movie The Hangover, it's a pretty modest house for someone who's as famous as Mike Tyson. It's still a really nice house. It's a little dusty. But it just wasn't, yeah. it wasn't like this palace like yeah. you saw in the movie. So we go in there, and to the left, there's a, or the left and the right, there are these, um, uh, not cabinets, but these shelves with a bunch of belts and other memorabilia from his career. And there's one of the, there's a bust of it, like I said. I know, it's crazy. So this is the kind of stuff, like, it's not even like a nice shelving unit. It's the kind of thing, like, you go into your grandmother's house and she'd have, like, a bunch of, like, <laughs> antique teapots and stuff on there. Right, right. But he's got, like, the heavyweight title belt. A and couple a of bust them. of himself and all these boxing awards. Yeah, and there, there's some photos from various po points in his, in his, in his career and we're waiting in his house for like 15 or 20 minutes before he emerges i'm getting nervous i'm like i'm in mike tyson's house like you just gotta keep reminding yourself that you're like i'm in mike tyson's house then then he emerges he and he's and he's a little hungry and he, he's wearing a black t-shirt and he eats a sandwich and we set up outside and you just hear his but, voice in the kitchen yeah and he's there, and, and it's his and it's his wife's mom is there who's helping with with the with the kids and so we go set up in the backyard, and then finally Mike Tyson comes out to do the interview, and and uh, um, and he's really nice, he's really friendly. And I remember I just looked back at this email, and you had the idea to um, you're just like, and one of the lines was, and maybe we should rub him up with Vaseline. <laughs> so we we stopped at a Ralph's or something before we went to came to Mike's house. So. I, and Mike is a great interview. He's introspective. He's interesting. He's engaging. He's funny. He, he sings. From, yeah, he goes from being like a little kid to like a philosopher in a matter of seconds. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. So at the end of the bit, there's so I'm like, hey Mike, I never understood what, like why you guys would get covered in Vaseline. And he's like, well, so you punch a slide off your face. I'm like, well, I can you show? Can you give me a little bit of your experience? So I go over. And it takes a good like two or three minutes to convince him to like to have to for him to rub my rub Vaseline all over my face. He's like, I don't know about anything about this Vaseline. Where'd you guys get it? I'm like, we just got it from the Ralphs, like two like a mile from your house. Like it's so I, I, I finally convince him and then it just it just clicks. And then he just has so much fun with just covering my face with his Vaseline. Dave is laughing in the background. Dying, this is crazy. Mike Tyson has just got his hands full of Vaseline and he's rubbing it all over Cabby's face. And I'm like, this is really happening. And like, yeah, a cameraman is watching it, but like, I'm watching it. Like, I'm watching it with the front row seat. Like, I, that shit you can't pay for. <laughs> like, with my own eyes, I saw Mike Tyson rub your face with Vaseline. And, um, and that, and Mike Tyson is one of those guys that we have on like our Mount Rushmore. And, Afterwards, he he was great, and and his his wife's 
mother and his wife both said like Mike doesn't do that very often like he doesn't give those type of interviews like it was you know and, and I think one of them said it, there was like 20 years ago you wouldn't have done that Mike yeah you'd be like no nah, yeah. I would have punched him out or so he said so, something mm -hmm. to that effect like this so I, I got I got lucky and I've been lucky uh, many times in my career so as have I thank you and one of them was certainly meeting uh, the man to my left my producer Dave Crixt because uh, 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 without you I don't know if I don't know if I would have done no, I know I wouldn't have done 100% of the stuff I've been able to do in my life. Untrue, untrue. But so thank th you. So thank you, sir, for coming in and telling some stories. On Twitter, it's at my man DK. On Instagram, it's at my man DK. And on Vine, which Dave has like a hundred vines, it's at my man DK. All one word, M Y M A N D K. Thank you for being on the podcast, thank and you. I hope you guys enjoyed these stories. Thank you for listening to Cabbie Presents, the podcast.